threw that in last week. I brought it out one more time this week just for my own amusement, if nothing else. But we started a series last week, and, and the intent behind it, we were calling the series Plato Jesus because what we began to say last week is there's a danger sometimes in the church that what we have done is we've taken the whole of who Scripture reveals Jesus to be to us, and we come across something and we say, I don't really understand that. And so we just kind of like pinch it off like, eh, don't know about that. Or, or we're reading in Scripture and we come across something that's kind of hard-hitting or kind of confrontational or maybe something that's hard to do. And we say, I don't think Jesus actually meant that. And so we start to form like our own Plato Jesus that looks like us and sounds like us and thinks like us and believes like us and votes like us. And the more he looks like us, the less he looks like the Jesus that's actually revealed in the Bible. But we said last week that, right, he is the potter and we are the clay. And so if something needs molding, if something needs shaping, if something needs changing, by default it has to be us. But too many times we've molded and we've shaped and we've pushed on our image and our view of Jesus until he's become something that we're comfortable with. And so we're on a journey in this series where what we're going to do is we're going to dive in and look at who Jesus really is. And what we'll see many weeks, I think, is that we'll see like one group has maybe latched onto this part of the story and one group has latched onto this part of the story, but we need the whole council of scripture to really understand who Jesus actually is. So if you're new to Christianity, if you're new to following Jesus, or if you don't know much about the Bible, um, if you ever look in the New Testament, there are four books of the Bible that we call the Gospels, right? There's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And if you're reading in some translations of the Bible, when you read those four books, you will see letters that are in red, right? Those are the words of Jesus, those are the words that Jesus spoke, and they, they are like otherworldly. They are powerful beyond measure. And so part of the intent, I think, in this series is to, to find the true power of what Jesus actually said, who Jesus actually was, what, what Jesus actually did. And sometimes it will help us as much to look at what he didn't say as it will to help us look at what he did say. So this morning, we're going to talk about what Jesus didn't, what Jesus did not say about happiness. Now, what I know this morning is that I think most of you probably want to be happy. Like, I don't know anybody who actually says out loud, my goal is to be miserable in life. Now, I know people who look like it. I know people whose faces look like it. I know people, anyway, I've seen, but I don't know anybody who actually out loud says, you know what I really want is just to, to be miserable, right? But what we want to look at this morning is what Jesus did not say about happiness. And it will help us find the power of what he did say, right? So let me give you some, some funsies um, before we dive into what Jesus did not say. Jesus did not say, go into all the world and preach whatever makes people happy, right? He didn't say that. He didn't say, whoever wants to be my disciple must affirm themselves and avoid the cross and follow their own heart. He didn't say that, right? Like, Jesus never said, like, in, in the context of, like, asking it'll be given to you, like, God is your celestial sugar daddy, like, God is your cosmic Coke machine, right? Jesus never laid that out there. God never said about our happiness, whatever you want, just beam it up, bro, and I'll make it happen. That is not in Scripture. This name it and claim it prosperity idea is not the Jesus of the Bible. And so this morning we're going to look in John's Gospel, we're going to go to John chapter 8 in a little bit, um, and we're going to look at kind of a long passage of scripture, kind of a long story that I think has incredible power and application for this, this mindset, this idea of Plato Jesus versus the reality of who Jesus actually is. And so when we look at this story, we're going to look really specifically at what Jesus did not say. Because what he actually did say has the power to transform our lives. And so we're going to go to John chapter 8. We're going to bump down and start in verse 2. And in John chapter 8, verse 2, the story starts this way. 
At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him and he sat down to teach them. It goes on, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees, all right? So, so the teachers of the law and the Pharisees, these were the people who looked really, really religious on the outside. These were the people who did all the right things, wore all the right stuff, said all the right words, washed their hands in just the right way. They were really, really, really good at putting on the mask. They were really, really good at going through the motions and doing what they were supposed to do. But in other places in Scripture... Jesus actually says that they're dead on the inside, that they're like whitewashed tombs, that you paint them up white and pretty on the outside, but they're just like dead bones. There's nothing alive on the inside. So this is, this is the group, this is the people that we're acknowledging there. And so it says, the teachers and the Pharisees of the law brought a woman caught in adultery. I'm scanning the room to see who's in the room. Okay, Bristol's not going to comprehend. It's fine. So we're talking about a woman who was, work with me here, caught in the act of adultery. This is a level 10 awkward situation in ministry, right? Like, we're out in the town square, and Jesus is doing ministry, right? Jesus is speaking into and discipling his disciples, and he's ministering to a larger group. Like, it's like Jesus has a life group in the town square, and he's speaking into them, and he's doing ministry, and all of a sudden, here come these hypocritical religious men, and they're probably literally dragging along a woman who the Bible says was caught in the act of adultery. A couple things about that particular statement, this particular story. Um, where was the man in the story? Like, if we're going to drag the woman into town square who was committing adultery, it takes two to tango. Like, where is the, where's the man in the story? I have strong feelings about that. But anyway, um, he's obviously left out. Secondly, secondly, I just made a word up. <laughs> I'm tore up from the floor up, and my coffee wasn't good this morning. So, um, secondly... What were these religious people doing that they found them acting in the, committing the act of adultery? Like, what were the religious dudes peeping at? That they, I'm, just, I'm just wondering out loud with you this morning. Like, what were they doing to catch this woman in the act, the Bible says, of adultery? That's a whole, that's a whole other deal going on. But nonetheless, here come the self-righteous, we-do-everything-right religious people dragging along behind them this woman who has been caught in the act of adultery. And if she has been caught in the act of adultery, she probably doesn't have much on. Okay? think for this woman, this would have been the lowest, most humiliating moment in her life, okay? Like, it's easy for us to just, like, be like, oh, woman in sin. <laughs> Maybe not that sin, but have you ever been caught in sin? Like, she's caught doing something, yes, she should not have done, but she is dragged into the town square, probably barely clothed, if at all, thrown down in the town square in the daylight in front of everybody and in front of Jesus, it's the most humiliating, lowest moment of her life. Here's what's interesting. These religious men did not care about her. They were only using her as a tool to try to catch Jesus up in something. Right? And you can see that if we keep reading on. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law of Moses, it commands us to stone such a woman. I mean, think about that. We have found her. We have caught her in the act of adultery. We have immediately dragged her away, probably barely clothed, if at all, thrown her down in the town square, and now what we're going to do is throw rocks at her until she dies. And they look at Jesus and say, all right, Jesus, now what do you say? Verse 6 goes on, it actually shows us the motive behind their question. John tells us in verse 6, they were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. How far is it from the heart of God to take somebody who's caught in sin, drag them out and embarrass them, and throw them down in front of everybody only to try to catch Jesus up in something? It is more evidence of how far the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were from the heart of the Father. And they put Jesus in what appears to be a no-win situation. Because according to the law of Moses, this woman was guilty. 
And according to the law of Moses, she should be stoned. Not for medicinal purposes, like actually stoned with actual stones. Um, <laughs> I'm all over the place this morning. Um, but the law of Moses says this, what she's doing should not happen. And so the prescribed punishment is to bring her out into the town square and stone her. And Jesus is in this weird spot because he has come to bring grace. He has come to bring life. He has come to bring freedom. He has come to bring a new dispensation of what it looks like to follow Jesus. But on the other hand, if Jesus says, no, nah, it's not really a big deal, guys. Let's just, let's just make an exception here. Then he's breaking the law of Moses, right? And, and it looks like he's condoning the sin of adultery. What is Jesus going to do? He's in a no-win situation. So it's interesting when John 8, 6 goes on. It tells us what they were doing. And then it says, but Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. Now, this is interesting. Because this is a spectacle of a situation. Remember, they have drugged this woman who was in the act of adultery out, and they've thrown her down in front of Jesus. And they come and they say, okay, Jesus, the law of Moses says we're supposed to stone her. What do you say, Jesus? And they're trying to trap him in something. And the Bible says that Jesus just kneels down and very quietly and calmly starts scribbling stuff in the sand. And so that raises the question that has been on everyone's mind that has read the Gospel of John in the last 2,000 years. What did Jesus write in the sand? We don't know for sure. There's some, in, in, there's some insight. There's some scholarly tracks that maybe we can track on what we think he said. But John was not so kind to give us details. Like, I don't give John full credit on his writing of chapter 8 because I would like a few more details, good sir. But he doesn't give them to us. But there are later manuscripts about John chapter 8 that say this, and this is what I love about Jesus. There is good scholarly evidence that came along not too long after John wrote John 8 that says what Jesus started to do was write out the sins of the Pharisees. Like the people who had brought her to him, Jesus looks around and says, oh, really, you want to stone her? And very calmly... Perhaps passive aggressively. I don't know. Can you say that about Jesus? He goes and he starts to just write down, fill, hmm, lustful thoughts about Gladys. Like he just, he just starts to, I mean, you think about it. You all know me. If you don't, this is the real me. Um, imagine, imagine Jesus like they think they've got him. He's in a rock and a hard place. What's he, what are you going to do now, Jesus? We got you. They've thrown this, I mean, I just, my heart just keeps coming back to this poor woman. She messed up, absolutely. They showed her no grace, no mercy, threw her down naked in front of Jesus. You want to stone her? And Jesus says, no, actually. And he just starts writing in the sand. And I really love the idea that maybe what he wrote was the sins of all of these religious people who had drugged this woman out. Um, I think there's maybe some traction to this actually being true. There are a couple of different Greek words that can be translated there as write down. Um, one is this word that means actually to write down, right? right? It can also mean against. So in some translations of the original language, the word that was used there when it says Jesus began to write down actually says Jesus began to write down against. Whew. So whatever Jesus wrote down in the sand, it was against someone or it was against something. And so I'm like, I just see like Jesus looking around and he finds Phil and then he writes down and he just <laughs> began. I'm glad, anybody hear name Phil this morning? I'm sorry. Um, if you watch on YouTube later, it's not you. Um, but think about it. He just begins to go around and write down the sins that these people are committing. The people who have come to bring accusations against this woman. Because they think they've got a, they think they've got like a perfect hand. Can't beat this one, Jesus. She was caught in the act of adultery. This is what the law of Moses says. She has to be stoned. All right, Jesus, you've been out here preaching, teaching all this new kind of, what are you going to do? Jesus bends down and begins to write in the sand. So the story goes on in verse 7. 
<laughs> when they kept questioning him. Now that's a bold move. If verse 6 was what we think it maybe was, if, there, if Jesus is in the process of writing out like a T-chart filled, <laughs> like he's just like going down and he's listing all their sins, it was a bold move to come back and keep on questioning him. But they did. The Bible says, when they kept questioning Jesus, he straightened up, so he stood back up from where he was kneeling down and writing in the sand, and he said to them, let any one of you who is without sin... In other words, if I can't write your name down here in the sand in this list that I'm making, you go right ahead. And in the context of the way this was written in the original Greek, when Jesus said, who's without sin, it means like not just without sin, but the word connotation actually meant you haven't sinned and you've never wanted to sin. Like it means literally with, even without wanting to sin. Now, I don't know about you. But there are a lot of times when I didn't do it, but I really wanted to do it. <laughs> like, can we be real this morning? Is that, too, is that too real for the pastor to say there's a lot of times he wants to sin? Right? There, there are times when I want to say it, and I want to type it, and I want to... Like, there are times when the thought is really strong within me. So what Jesus says is, if you've never sinned and you've never thought about sinning, because isn't it true that we're really good at finding other people's sins, but we're also really good at covering up our own? It's really easy to point the finger at other people when we're doing the same thing they are, or maybe something worse, or maybe something different. Can I be real with you? It's like me preaching on self-control a few weeks ago, and then leaving here and going to the buffet at Kane Kitchen, and sitting there wanting to go back for a second plate. Even though I am completely full, I have, my needs have been met, I am full, and I'm wanting to go back for a second plate, and I'm eyeing the ice cream machine, right? Like, I didn't do it, but I really wanted to, so I would have been disqualified, because I really wanted to be gluttonous, right? I really wanted to be a glutton. And so Jesus says, whoever is not only without sin, but without having wanted to sin, you go ahead and pick up the rock, and you can be the first one to hurl it at this woman, right? Like he who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Verse 8 says this. Uh, again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. I'm going to guess Phil was not the one who continued questioning Jesus, our hypothetical Phil in this scenario. But he hadn't finished his list yet, and so they kept on pressing Jesus. But Jesus comes and says, all right, guys, whoever hasn't sinned and has never thought about sinning in your life, you go ahead and you throw the first stone. And Jesus stoops down and keeps riding. And it's interesting. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older ones first until only was Jesus was left with the woman standing there. Why do you think they left? Because I don't want Jesus writing me on the list. I don't want him getting to me. Like he has, as Jesus only could, he completely flipped what they thought was their trump card. And he completely turned it back on them. Like this is an ultimate uno reverse. And Jesus comes back at them with this argument. And all they can do is just walk away. And many times when we see the story depicted, like you see them walking away in the stone, just thudding to the ground as they walk away. So the older ones leave. And then it's just Jesus left with this woman. And again, this is still a level 10 awkward situation. Because she's been caught in the act of adultery, brought straight from there to Jesus, thrown down, probably barely wearing anything. And then Jesus straightens up. And he begins to ask her, Woman, where are they? Woman, where are your accusers? Has no one condemned you? And she says, no one, sir. And Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. Praise God. Do you understand? Jesus was legally completely justified saying, all right, boys, grab your stones and do it. Like he flipped a whole mindset on his head in about nine or ten verses here. Jesus was completely justified in doing it. But he showed this woman grace that perhaps no one in that situation, in that culture, had ever been shown before. And he looks at her and says, where are your accusers? 
I don't have any. Jesus said, he says, I don't, I don't, I don't condemn you either. But here's what Jesus did not say. Jesus did not say, then neither do I condemn you. Go do whatever makes you happy. Go now and listen to your heart, right? It doesn't matter what you do as long as you don't hurt anybody, right? He does not look at this woman and say, you do you, boo-boo. Like he, he does not say any of those things that perhaps our culture would say. Jesus says, where are your accusers? Has nobody con condemned you? She says, no one, sir. And he says, neither do I condemn you. And this is what Jesus did say. He said, go now and leave your life of sin. This was not a condemning, judgmental statement. This was full of love. Jesus has just shown this woman the ultimate grace and love that he could have possibly shown her in this situation. He has just literally shielded her from death. And he says, I don't condemn you either. But go and leave your life of sin. It wasn't a condemning statement, but it was full of urgency. Go. Go now. Don't wait. You are free. You can live a better life. Don't wait. You don't have to live in shame anymore. You don't have to live for, like, the lower things of this world. You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to hide and slink in the darkness. I've set you free. Now go and be free and live free. Like what Jesus says to her is full of love. And it's full of grace. You don't have to be held hostage anymore. You are free to, to go and, and walk in truth. But what I think is interesting is I think that there are two versions of Plato Jesus maybe at play there. Because sometimes there's part of the church that just says, neither do I condemn you, and we stop there. Right? Like, who are you to accuse her? Neither do I. Like, that's absolutely a part of who Jesus was. But in the next breath, he said, go and leave your life of sin. My fear is there's also a branch of the church that says, go and leave your life of sin without the grace. It's all, you know, like score heaping and, and watching and judgmentalism and check boxes of, did you do this? Did you not do this? Like both of those have to be brought together to have the full understanding of who Jesus is. By themselves, they're just Plato versions. And, and by themselves, they turn into like hyper grace and they turn into legalism. We have to bring them together to fully understand who Jesus is. Because we read this story and we read about this woman and we think, oh my gosh, I cannot imagine being... Maybe not that sin. But are there, are there sins? Are there issues? Are there hang-ups in our lives? We don't have to be held hostage to them any longer. Why is it that so many of us give in to temptation so often? It's not a hard question because it looks so appealing. It looks fun. It can be fun, right? Can a pastor say sin can be fun? I'm just saying, like, the enemy is not, like, trying to allure you away to, like, things that look awful. He is trying to make things look appealing. That's why Hebrews calls it the fleeting pleasures of sin. It's pleasurable for a little while. It can be fun for a little while, and then it will mess us up. Because what does temptation do? Sin promises satisfaction at the cost of of disobedience to God and eventual pain to you. Sin promises satisfaction at the cost of disobedience to God and eventual pain to you. Right? Sin comes along and says, you're going to like this. It's going to be good. It's going to make you feel happy. You're really going to enjoy it. It promises you satisfaction at the cost of being disobedient to God and eventually bringing pain on yourself. I, try to, I like to try to get into the mind of this woman that was caught in the act of adultery. We have no idea what kind of woman she was. We only know um, the story of her most egregious sin that she happens to get caught in. Like maybe she was an evil woman who woke up one day and said, you know what I want to do today is I want to be a home wrecker and I want to go like wreck somebody's marriage and ruin my life and possibly get stoned today. Maybe that's what she said. But maybe she was somebody who had been brought up and raised the right way and just made a series of bad decisions and let her heart and temptation take her somewhere that she shouldn't have gone and she woke up one day and said, oh my gosh, what have I done? Very likely could have been that. 
It's interesting. The Lord has broken my heart for this woman as I've read this story. And that's never happened to me before. Like I've read it and thought about, oh my gosh, the grace and mercy. But he's just broken my heart for this woman in this story this time. Because here she is finding herself barely dressed in the most publicly ashamed moment of her life. And how did she get there? I'm not convinced she woke up and said, like, I want to wreck my life and destroy my family name today. But sin promises satisfaction at the cost of disobedience to God and eventual pain to yourself. Why do we end up in those kinds of situations? We live in a relativistic culture, or a culture of relativism. What is relativism? Relativism is this belief that everything is relative. Right? Culture tells us there's no absolute truth. Right? We'll hear this all the time in our culture today. We're, we will hear people say things like, well, that may be true to you, but that's not true to me. That's your truth, but I have a different truth. Live your truth. I'll keep my truth. There's, that is not biblically okay. That does not line up with God's word. But there's this mentality in the world of relativism that says, you do what makes you happy, and I'll do what makes me happy, and you do what you believe is true, and I'll do what I believe is true, and there's this relative idea that there is no absolute truth. Here's the fundamental problem. Without a belief in absolute truth, then truth becomes defined by whatever makes me happy. And when the bottom line is my happiness, then happiness becomes the, the standard by which I judge my actions. If I don't believe there is an absolute truth, if I don't believe the word of God, the counsel of the Holy Spirit, the life and the example of Jesus, if I don't believe that is absolutely true and the moral standards in it are absolutely true and have to guide my life, then I will let my life be defined by whatever makes me happy instead. And when I define my life by my happiness... When the bottom line is my happiness and not my holiness, not my obedience, not the standard that God has, has set for me, I will get myself into a world of hurt. We start to believe things like, well, if it makes me happy, it must be good. <sighs> Guys, that is what the enemy does. That's why he's called a deceiver. That's why he's called a liar and the father of all lies. On the converse, we start to think, if it doesn't make me happy, then it must make me bad. It's not true. But the enemy has made us believe this. Like we start to say things like, I know everybody says we're not supposed to do this. I know everybody says this is wrong, but it feels so right. And there's a root problem there. Because I think for many of us, the problem is we, that we think happiness and holiness are always at odds. Like, like, deep down, we maybe have a distorted view of who Jesus is and what he teaches, and, and we think you have to choose either happiness or holiness. Like, we think if you choose holiness, then you are destined to this lifelong, like, sentence of being, like, miserable forever and ever. And if I'm honest with you, that's a little bit of what I believed growing up. Like, I thought if I really became a follower of Jesus, then I really wasn't allowed to have fun. And I'm going to be destined to live, like, a life wearing, like, my braided leather belt and my pleated khakis and listening to Amy Grant tapes for the rest of my life. <laughs> and if you don't know what a tape is, you sure don't know who Amy Grant is. Um, but it's okay. You can still go to heaven. Um, but I had this distorted view that, like, this little limited sphere was how you had to live in this, like, weird subculture and do all these things and forsake, like, no. And I probably would have never said it out loud. I probably would have never described it this way then. But I had this mentality that, from because of what I was seeing, that if I follow Jesus, I'm going to live my life in misery. That is not true. Have y'all, I mean, have y'all been around? Like, we have a good time. We're, I don't know if we're always appropriate, but we have a really good time. Um... Like, God is not looking down from heaven, looking on you, whom he loves. God's not looking at you and saying, for God so loved the world that he wants his children to be holy and miserable. He's a good, loving father. 
Like, in fact, Jesus actually said this about our Father God. He said, if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, and how many of you love to give good gifts to your children or maybe your grandchildren, right? We love to spoil them. We love to see them be happy. He said, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Like, if we find ourselves at odds with this idea like, I want to be holy, but I don't want to be unhappy. Can I tell you what the problem is? You're looking for happiness in the wrong place. You're looking in this lower place to find fulfillment and happiness when God designed you to come up to a higher place. In fact, Max Lucado tells a really good illustration, and I'm going to completely butcher it and steal it and make it my own. Um, because, yeah. Um, but, but Max asked this question. He said, would a fish ever be happy on the beach? Like, imagine you take a fish out of water, and you put the fish up on the hot sand of the beach. Would a fish ever be happy there? And I'm almost certain the answer would be no. Right? Like, what's that fish going to be doing? He's going to be flopping. I would illustrate, but that's a terrible idea. But the fish would be laying on the beach, and he would be flopping. Now, imagine we give this fish some things of this world to help the fish feel happy. Like, we walk up to this fish laid on the beach, and we just start making it rain bingies, right? Like, we just give him all the cash that we can imagine. Is the fish now happy? No. Um, imagine instead we throw a party for the fish and we get all of the best looking fish out of the sea and we bring them all together and we hire uh, I'm trying to think of a really cool DJ name for a fish on the fly and that was terrible so we hire a DJ and we come in and he drops the beat and there's all these fish and he's surrounded by all of these fish that are just great <laughs> is the fish happy now? no Let's imagine we bring him a giant margarita on the beach because he's laying there. Did I just bring up a margarita in church? I sure did. But let's imagine we bring him a little drinky drink, right? And it's got an umbrella. Is that fish happy now? No. Oh, let's imagine we go and we take a selfie wish with the fish and, and we're like making fish face. And we go out and we put it on our social medias and people are commenting like, ooh, fire. And it's getting likes and shares and all the things like, is the fish happy now? No. Why is the fish not happy? Because the fish was not created to be on the beach. Could it be that the reason we're not happy is because we are trying to live for a world that we were not created for? We are trying to live seeking after things that we were not created for. We are trying to live in pursuit of things that are so far below what our Father in heaven has for us. Like if we find ourselves wondering why we're not happy living for the things of this world. Maybe we need to lower our expectation of the things of earth because we were not created for the things of earth. We were created by God, for God, to live for things that are not of this world. And that's why sin promises, but it never delivers. It promises satisfaction at the cost of disobedience to God and eventual pain to you. So here's what we need to understand, and this is important, I think. Holiness is not mutually exclusive of happiness. In fact, they're really related. Holiness is the pathway to true happiness and joy. Now, let me say it again. They're not mutually exclusive. exclusive. They're united. They're, they're connected. When we, when we learn, live for God and not for the lower things of this world... When we begin to live for the higher things that are eternal, that's the pathway that takes us to true meaning in life. Holiness is a word that freaks people out in 2024. It's the standard. We serve a holy God who consistently throughout Scripture will say things like, be holy because I'm holy. Pursue holiness without which no man will see God. What does holiness mean? Who's holy? God's holy. And so holiness is doing what? Becoming like him. And so there are things we have to evaluate. Would my father do this? Would my father be entertained by this? Would my father say this? And over time, he'll begin to skim those things away and help make us more and more like him. That's holiness. 
Now, sometimes the church has tried, as we often do, to manipulate that. And we've begun to make like lists and check boxes. Well, holiness is you wear a skirt to here and you grow your hair to here and you don't wear this and you don't grow. He doesn't need our help. He put the Holy Spirit inside us. He's our comforter. He's our teacher. Jesus lived the example for us. The Father is the model that we go after. He's got it covered. And he doesn't need our help. But when we walk with him, he wants to make us more like him. And it does not mean that we're going to go off and be like aggravated and like he wants us to be happy, but he wants us to be happy in his will. Psalm 16, verse 11. David said this. He said, you make known to me the path of life. In your, pleasure, in your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. That's who our God is, right? He makes known to us what his path is. In his presence there's fullness of joy. In his right hand is everything we could ever imagine. He wants us to have pleasures and joy and happiness, but he wants us to walk with him. And he won't always take you on a path that leads to happiness. He'll sometimes take you on a path into the wilderness that'll make you holy. But he always has your goodwill at heart. And that's why this woman at the well, in John chapter 8, she was as guilty as we are guilty, maybe not of the same things, but she was guilty. And she's in her most shame-filled moment of her life. And Jesus does not look at her and say, you know what, I am embarrassed by your behavior. After all I've done for you, this is the way you choose to live. You are pathetic. Jesus did not say that to her. Our flesh might say that to her. That is not what Jesus said or modeled for us. What Jesus said is there something so much better. Go be free. Go walk in truth. Go, go leave the lower things of this sin-filled world and, and live for the things that really, really matter in life. But guys, this morning, what do we do? What do we do when we know what's right, but we keep doing what's wrong? What do we do when we feel trapped? Like it looked good and it promised something, but it didn't deliver and now we can't find our way out. What do you do when it's wrong and you know it's wrong, but you feel like you can't get out? But what do you do when the thing that, that, that used to be just a drink at the end of the workday becomes something that consumes and dominates your life? For some of you, it's not beer or alcohol, it's something else. You're medicating something and you're trying to fill a void in your life with approval. Like, will they like me enough? Can I get their approval? Maybe it's something you smoke. Maybe it's something you pop. Maybe it's you feel so empty on the inside that you try to fill yourself up with food and keep eating and eating, and then you feel embarrassed and you try to hide it, but you keep doing it. Maybe it's this feeling of emptiness. And so you somehow believe that if I can just get this thing, whatever it may be, then I can begin to like be happy again, whether it's a pair of shoes or a, a purse, right? It's this image that we're after, and so we spend and we overspend, and we wait and we wait and we wait for that box to be delivered for our house because what's in that box, we think, is what we need to make us happy. For some of us, it's our entertainment choices. We're entertained by things that don't glorify God. We watch things in television. We watch things in movies that are not God-honoring and are not edifying us but our flesh just really enjoys it. Or, or we, we read, and, and we read books about things that God did not intend for us to meditate on, about other people. And we get this feeling when we read these books about these fictional characters that are reserved for our husband or our wife. For some of us, it might be a critical spirit. And so the way we deal with our low self-esteem is to crush everybody else around us. We pick everybody else and everyone else apart. And we don't know why we do it, but it's like we just don't like anybody anymore or anything. For some of us, it may be the wrong kind of relationship. We go back and they mistreat us. And so we go and we find somebody else who mistreats us again. And we know it's not God's best and we know it's not God's plan, but we can't quite figure out how we got there. Maybe we're in a relationship where we know we're giving benefits without the covenant. Because sex outside of God's design for marriage is sinful. And it's outside God's plan for us. 
Whatever it is this morning, there are things in our lives, if we were open, if we were transparent, some really visible, some really hidden, there are things in our life that we think, man, I know this isn't right. I know this isn't God's plan. I know this isn't God's best, but I don't know what to do. But I came this morning to tell somebody about the faithfulness and the goodness and the grace of God that is available to you at this moment. Paul said it this way in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. And our God is faithful. Our God, he's always faithful. He is so faithful that he, what? he will never let us be tempted beyond what we can bear. But listen to me. When you're tempted, when you're trapped, when you're stuck, when you feel like you're in a prison, when you feel like there's no way out, when you're, when you're tempted, when you're stuck, the Bible says God will always provide a way out so that you can endure it. There's always grace. There is always potential for freedom. He is always looking to give us a way out. It's a little bit like video games. And there's all kinds of, I know, like my transitions are so abrupt. With this really serious moment. And then let me tell you about video games. But there are all kinds of popular video games today, right? There's Call of Duty and there's Fortnite and all those things. I grew up in a different era. Like I can still remember going to my grandparents and, and grandpa had like the old school, regular old Atari with just like a joystick and a button. Like I can remember back in the day when we had a Pizza Hut and you went to Pizza Hut, like even in my childhood, their video games were way outdated. And so I was playing things that were like way behind in the times. I remember things like Pac-Man and Frogger and Galaga and Dig Dub. But there was a, there was a game called Asteroids. And the, ga the graphics on Asteroids, if you go Google image search it, they're unbelievable. Right? Like the spaceship was like this. Like that was, that was the extent of like the effort and time put in. But there were Asteroids that would come your way and you had unlimited firepower. Right? You could, you could blow up your asteroids and there would be asteroids coming all over towards your little triangle spaceship and you could thrust forward and you could try to move around stuff. And when you were in trouble, there was a button. The button was called hyperspace. And so you could hit hyperspace and your little triangle spaceship would disappear off the screen. You were somewhere else. There was always a way out. It doesn't make sense, and it's not rational, and it doesn't follow our human mindset. But can I tell you, the Father always has a way out for you. You can't figure it out. You can't dig your way out. You can't claw your way out. You can't strive and strain self-control and find your way out. But there is a Father who is just waiting on you to press the button. And he wants to rescue you and pull you out. He wants to set you free. He wants to break things off of you. He wants to renew your mind. He wants to help you walk in his path and his plan. But too many times we are mired down here in the mess and he's waiting on us to just ask him to just press the button. Our God is faithful, and he will always, Paul says, he will always give you a way out. But what do you do when you're tempted? I hope we'll understand this. Every temptation is an invitation to depend on Jesus. He's not asking you to figure this out. He's not asking you to strive and strain to do this thing on your own power. He's actually asking you to lean on him. To, 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 to partner with him, to ask him in, to ask for his help. Every time you feel trapped, every time you feel tempted, it is an invitation to depend on the grace of Jesus. What do you do when you're trapped? You recognize it and you call on him and he gives you a way out. Like I'm not here this morning to say, here are the seven steps you need to follow to get yourself out if you're trapped in sin, because I don't have them, he does. When you're trapped, you go to him, not Josh. You go to him, and he wants to rescue you out of these things. And he doesn't look down on you and say, I'm so embarrassed by you. I'm so ashamed of you. I can't believe you would do this. Now go do you, boo-boo. He doesn't say any of that stuff to us. We sang about him this morning, and I didn't tell him to sing that song, but it is a perfect song. What kind of father would run, run, run to me after all that I've done? <laughs> I love the story of the prodigal son. It's one of my probably top three favorite parables. 
because in that culture, that son screwed up everything you could possibly screw up. He disrespected his father in the family name. He went out and screwed up and gave away all the inheritance. He lived wild and got drunk and partied and did all the wild stuff and found himself face down in the mud with the pigs. Absolute disgrace brought on the family. And biblical scholars tell us that if we read between the lines of what that story was saying, that what the father actually did is he went out to the edge of his property line every day and he looked, just hoping that today would be the day that his son would come home. And when the son finally came home, the Bible doesn't say he stood back and waited on him to get there with his arms crossed. No, the Bible says he ran to meet him and he threw his arms around him. And that dude was covered in mud and pig poop. And the father just ran to put his arms around him. And he brought him back. And he didn't give him a lecture. He didn't tell him, you got to, you're on probation for six months and you've got to earn your way back into this thing. He threw a party. He put a ring and a robe on him. He put sandals on his feet. He said, kill the fattened calf. We're having a hog roast. Hire a DJ. We're having a party. He just threw everything to celebrate this son who's come home. So don't you let the enemy convince you this morning that because there is a sin issue in your life that the father is up there just like... <laughs> it's not who he is. It is one of the Plato versions that a segment of the church has created. It's not who he is. Now, at the same time, he is not up there saying, okay, let's just dust you off and do it again. No, what he's saying is, go and sin no more. I, I want to help you live a life free from this thing. I don't want you to keep in this spiral. I don't want you to keep in this rabbit wheel. I don't want you to keep in this cycle. I want to break it and help you live free. But he's waiting on us to ask him. And there is a big difference between remorse and repentance. That remorse is, I got caught. And I'm really, really sorry that I got caught. And I'm like really emotionally upset that I got caught. But repentance is something entirely different. Repent means to turn. Repent means to turn from these things that are low and begin to turn towards the things that are high. Repent means to turn from the direction that we were going and, and do something different. Repent means to let him renew our minds until we become something different. And when you feel trapped, and when you feel caught, and when you feel broken, and when you feel shamed, Jesus does not say, oh, that wasn't good, now go do what makes you happy. He says, I've got a better path for you. I've got a better plan for you. I'm not going to let you anybody throw stones at you. Do you understand the grace and the mercy of a father who says, I realize you are absolutely, positively, totally guilty of sin, literally, but I'm going to shield you and protect you from what other people are trying to do to you because I want to restore you? That's the real Jesus. Because holiness and happiness are not at odds. They're actually really connected. And you were created to walk in truth. And when we walk in truth, that's when we find real and lasting joy. So there's a Plato version of Jesus that fixates on the whole, let he who is without sin cast the first stone, neither do I condemn you, lines. And there's a whole wing of the church that has a Plato Jesus that focuses in on the now go and leave your life of sin. We need to understand it's the same Jesus. The same Jesus that has grace for us, that shields us, that, that gets the accusers off of us, also calls us to live holy. He's both. So what is the real Jesus calling you to do this morning? I think there's, I think there's response. I think there's action steps to, to be taken this morning. Is he calling you to drop your judgmental attitude toward other people? Maybe this morning he's got you fixed it on. You're kind of like the Pharisees in this story. It's time to drop your stone. Start shielding and protecting and loving on people. And maybe this morning it's, it's the go and leave your life of sin line. And maybe Jesus would say, hey, there are things in your life, there are sin cycles that you are caught in and you know that you are. But it feels like it's been covered up and kind of pushed away and subdued for so long that you don't know what to do. He says, I've made a way of escape for you. But I need you to come and invite me into this thing and let's deal with it. Maybe this morning you've never given your life to Jesus for the first time. He's in the room. His standard is holiness. He expects us to live holy lives. Things that we have tolerated, things that we have made excuses for, things that we have danced around, things that are undermining our relationship and keeping us from his best. Things that are keeping us from really walking out the kingdom lifestyle and seeing what the early church saw. Compromise. 
What do you need to repent of today? What strongholds need to be torn down today? What do you need to finally acknowledge to Jesus today and let him set you free from? He's here this morning, and he wants to meet with us. He wants to dust us off. He wants to give us a new mindset if we've been that, like, religious accusatory person. He wants to make a way of escape if we're caught in things that need to be dealt with. But he's looking for us to ask. He's looking for us to come to him and actually have a heart of repentance. So let's stand this morning.